you know, women in the church are seen as lesser than men. Mm. Like, there's even a governing body member who said women have smaller brains than men. Yeah. So women are seen quite lesser than men in the church. Like, women have no roles. There's nothing you can become as a woman. A man can become an elder, a ministerial servant, a circuit overseer, an elder. Like, there's so many positions you can do as a man. A woman, nothing. You can just be a, a pioneer. A pioneer is someone who preaches from house to house and they just do it like a full-time job. Like, mm. they do it almost every day. They have, like, a quota of hours. I don't know if they still have because they've also changed the hours system. But basically, women are, are treated like that in that church or cult, whatever. Hi, and welcome to the Tea World podcast with your host, with the most, Queen Rami. We are a home of life-changing conversations. We share life experiences. Let's share your journey of restoration. I love you. Hello once again. You are more than welcome to our podcast, The Tea World. And I'm your host with the most. And my name is Queen Rami. It is indeed another episode. And do not forget that we are fully sponsored by Scent Studios. Do follow them on their Instagram page. And do not forget to also check me out on my personal channel, Queen Rami Talks. And today, once again, we have an amazing guest in our midst, Monica in the house, fellow YouTuber. <laughs> ba, 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 ba. <laughs> Welcome, gorgeous Thank one. you. Thank you for having me. How are you? I am doing very good. How are you doing? Ah, but I'm blessed and highly. Get a Amen. <laughs> Okay, okay, before we go far, who is Monica? Wow, Monica is a young woman who's turning 31 in the next month. I can't believe it. Gorgeous girl. Born and bred in Pretoria. Professionally, I am a communications professional. Okay. I specialize in digital communications. I'm mm. also a content creator. That's how I met you. Yes, YouTube <laughs> graduates in the house. <laughs> And I survived a cult, guys. I am a cult survivor. I used to be part of but Homeless Witnesses. And I left the religion, I say, seven years ago now? 2017, mm. when was that? Yeah, seven years ago. Mm. Before we get into the cult, how did you grow up? I grew up in Hamanskral, and I'm part of a very big family. We mm. are, in total, six children. I am the youngest, the last born. And I was very fortunate enough to be raised in a household with a present mother and a present father. I know in a lot of black households, the father normally is not present. But fortunately for me, my dad was around. And it was fairly a good upbringing. Mm. I was born in 1993, so right before South Africa was liberated i would say but i was born at a very <laughs> difficult time mm. when uh when i was born i was born in may and in april that's when chris honey was assassinated mm. so it was quite a difficult time when my mother was giving birth to me okay. but she really tried by all means to give me a good life and yeah she did so i would say i grew up quite well at home mm. but i was also raised as a jehovah's witness and that is another thing altogether mm. it was quite challenging to always feel singled out at school because we wouldn't partake in birthdays we wouldn't partake in easter for example mm. and as I, I didn't even mention this but i was quite fortunate that my mom worked for this amazing um preschool and it was a government preschool so this was before 1994 so when preschools there were some preschools that were government owned okay. and if a preschool was government owned the the employer the employees could um have their children attend the school for free. Mm. So I was actually in an Afrikaans preschool. Oh, okay. Can an Afrikaans. Yeah, can Afrikaans. Oh, on the prat is so. So I went to an Afrikaans preschool and, mm. you know, just uh, experiencing life where you see how white people live and how black people live was quite jarring, to be honest. And then, you know, white children had a lot of privileges that we didn't have as black kids. Mm. So birthday parties were really a big thing, okay. you know, and I was one of a few, one of like a few black kids in the school. So, you know, kids don't really see color. They don't really see race. So I always felt embraced by other children. Mm. So they would always want to invite me to their birthday parties. They'd always want to, you know, include me in things. And because of my upbringing, there were times where 
I couldn't go to a birthday party and I didn't understand, like, but why? And then, mm. of course, they would explain, no, because of our belief systems as Jehovah's Witnesses, you can't and stuff like that. And yeah, that was quite difficult, to be honest. That's I would right. say trauma on its own because mm. you constantly feel singled out and you feel like, is there something wrong with this mm. religion? Or I don't know. Yeah, I always felt just out of place. So being out of place, you're only noticing that now as you're an adult or even as you were still growing, you could see some gaps. I could see some gaps. I think what actually helped me is my siblings because my siblings are much older than me, some of them. So they left the church earlier than me. Oh, okay. So through them, I was kind of able to experience a normal life or life outside of the church. And then I was able to see that, okay, no, when I'm with my siblings, I kind of, I'm a different person to who I am when I'm at church. And then I'm also a different person at school. So all of these different people I was trying to embody, I was aware, I would say as a child, but mm. at the same time, I thought it was normal. And because of my personality, I, it was easy for me to make friends. So along the way, I don't know why I'd always encounter Jehovah's Witnesses. Like even now, part of your team here, these ah, people I encounter. We are offline. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> but I'm just saying, I, I always encountered people mm. that are similar to me. And I think those experiences kind of made it easier. But if officially when I left, that's when I totally unpacked everything. And I did realize that, you know what? There was a lot of trauma with how I was raised and a lot of things that didn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. And initially, I, I was angry at my parents. I was very, very angry. But I understand now that, honestly, they were just trying to do the best with the very, very limited information that they had. And that religion is a religion that very, that very much prides on people who are in difficult situations. And it exploits that because mm -hmm. when you're going through hardships, like as I mentioned, when my mom was when she just gave birth to me, she went through postpartum depression. So she was essentially depressed mm. as you were just looking for an avenue to just, you know, change her life or fix whatever is wrong. Mm. So I, I understand now and I'm no longer angry. I'm just, yeah, I'm just living life. I'm just trying to make the most of life. You know, as I'm listening to you, I realize that let's talk to people as if they do not even know what mm. Jehovah's Witness is. Let's take it from the roots. What okay. is it all about? Yeah. You know, I was even looking this up yesterday, trying to like get the correct terminology, but there's so many words to even use. Mm. But it's a Christian denomination. They don't okay. believe in Trinity because I saw a word that said um, they're non trinity Trinitarian, I can't even say the word, but they don't believe in Trinity. But it's a it's a Christian denomination. They believe in God, Jesus, God as in Jehovah, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. Mm. And it was a religion that started in America in the early 1900s or late 1800s by mm. a man named Charles Taze. Charles Taze Russell. Okay. Turns out he's actually a Zionist. A lot of people don't know this. Yeah. I also, when I did research, I found out he's actually a Zionist. And Benjamin Netanyahu actually thanked him for the work that he did mm. for helping Israel be Israel because he was actually quite monumental in helping the Jewish people establish the country mm. of Israel. So he formed the Jehovah's Witnesses and already from there, there's research papers you can find from 1990, I mean 1944 already, mm. where they talk about how the Jehovah's Witnesses is actually a cult, a doomsday religion with lots and lots of failed prophecies. And it's a normal religion as you would see when you look at them from the outside. Mm. But when you're inside, it's a high control religion where members are controlled in terms of how to dress, how to carry themselves, who to spend their time with. Yeah. They are discouraged from pursuing a higher education. Mm. They, um, oh, there's so many things I feel like I can just talk to when it comes to the Jehovah's Witness. Yeah, so I need Ask to know, questions, please. I, I, I need to know as you were growing up, what is it that you were not allowed to do? I wasn't allowed to attend birthday parties. I don't, we didn't celebrate even our own birthdays. So literally your Yo. birthday is just another day. 
I remember in grade four, I even forgot my birthday. Like the school I was in, in assembly on a Monday, they would have the people who have a birthday that week stand up and they would celebrate their birthdays. Mm. And I remember they called my name and I was like, oh my gosh, it's my birthday this week. I even forgot. It was like just another day just like that. And we they didn't celebrate, they don't celebrate Easter. They don't celebrate Christmas. Um, Those are holidays considered to be pagan. So okay. they don't celebrate those. I think the only holiday... It's not even a holiday, but the only thing they do celebrate is um, the memorial of Jesus Christ. Mm. So when Jesus died, that's the day they do um, view. And then let me see, we weren't allowed to just hang around with everyone. So you're very selective in terms of who your friends are. You very much encourage that your friends should be the people in the religion and not outside of the religion. People who are, who are outside of the religion are called worldly people. Mm. So... Even relationships. No, you can't date someone who is not part of the religion. You can be removed for that. Wow. You can also not, um, let me see. You can't marry someone who's outside, outside of the church. You also like limit your time. So like if someone starts discouraging you about the church, you are definitely obligated to spend less time with that person. Mm. So yeah, it's one of those. I I'm trying to really think. Mm. It's been some time, yeah. So apart from you seeing from your older siblings that there is something wrong, when did you realize? You know, it, 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 it happened quite slowly, but people, you know, random people. I remember we'd, we'd, we'd go house to house and preach to people. Okay. And there's this lady, I'll never forget her. She was like, she looked at me. She's like, you're wasting your time. <laughs> I hope you know you're wasting your time with this church. And I was so Life insulted. Ninja. I was like, yeah. oh my gosh, <laughs> let's leave this heathen. <laughs> you know? But it sparked something. Yeah. And then I dated this guy in the church. He was way older than me. He actually lied about his age. Yeah, too. Turned out, at minimum, he was eight years older than me. I mm. thought it was just like four or five years older than me. But I dated this guy and he was actually starting to read up on the religion. And he shared the information with me. Again, I was quite resistant. I was like, what is this? Mm. You know, and I it just stopped. But I'm very, very lucky that my parents were people who really encouraged me to pursue education. Okay. So I studied. And you know, when you, you study at school, you do research in university. Mm. And when you do research, they always tell you, you have to have multiple sources and stuff. So I really strengthened my muscle of doing research. Mm. And then once I was done with university and I got my first big girl job, I did this boring job. My first job was data capturing. So I had a lot of time. So I would listen to YouTube videos. So I started just, oh, let me just listen to Jehovah's Witnesses around the world. Mm. And I started listening to those videos and then... All of a sudden, I meet ex Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay. And then they start highlighting things that are wrong in the religion. And you find out that in the beginning of this religion, they didn't allow black people to mm. be Jehovah's Witnesses. And they then started recruiting black people when they realized other evangelical Christian churches who were coming to Africa to have, I mean, they had missionaries in Africa, they were making money. Mm -hmm. And then the Jehovah's Witnesses were like, oh, here's an opportunity for us. So then they started allowing black people into the religion. And what they did was quite smart because they treated black people quite differently from how Americans treated black people. They treated them very well, quite respectfully, but... When you do more research, you just realize that they were trying to change how black people should view themselves, especially black men. And they, are, they were just trying to colonize even our, our being, I would say that. So in just doing more research and learning about the history of Jehovah's Witnesses, that's when I really started to wake up. And then the pivotal moment for me was when the Black Lives Movement was taking place in America. And then I started doing research a bit about you know, what's happening and then like, what is the Jehovah's Witness stance in terms of, you know, how black people are treated. Mm. And then I saw this article about like, p um, Christians shouldn't protest, like the Jehovah's Witness has released their own article about how Christians shouldn't protest. We just believe that God will change the world in the new system. And I realized, no, this only benefits white people. Because if things continue as it is, mm. they live well. We black people don't live well. Mm. Then I did further research and then I came across something called the Royal Commission. Okay. So in Australia, they did a royal um, 
a whole proceeding where they were investigating the Jehovah's Witnesses because they have, I don't know if I can say this on your channel, but they have a CSA problem. You guys will mute me if you have to, but it's a child sex abuse problem. Okay. The religion has a pedophilia problem and the religion is hiding it. And members sure. don't even know. And the investigation was in Australia. And then they had someone called a governing body member. And it's a very big person in the church. Mm. These governing body members are essentially considered to be just below Jesus Christ. So anything they say in the church is literally adhered to. Because in the church, they are seen as people who have a direct link to God. So yeah. a governing body member was on the stand lying about how they handled child sexual abuse within the church. Mm. And it's disgusting. Yeah. It's really disgusting because they know the men who are harming children and women in the church and they've been mandated to hide those names. And yeah. because, you know, governments make money from religions, they sometimes don't even bother. Mm, so the police mute. try to investigate and get the names. The Jehovah's Witnesses said no. And because of legal things, they can't get those names of mm. people who are harming children. Then in Japan as well, they are now being also investigated for child abuse problems because it's an epidemic, if I can call it that. Mm. It's, it's happening globally. And statistics also show that a child is most likely to be harmed by someone they're in the same congregation with. Sure. And Jehovah's Witnesses, as mentioned earlier on, that they really encourage fellowship amongst each other mm. and to avoid and limit time with people outside of the religion. So you would harm, just, you know, come to my house, come visit me, and we're just having a fellowship, we're enjoying time. You bring your children. Maybe I have children as well. Mm. I don't even know this, but my husband is actually harming children we're just hanging out and then my husband maybe vanishes and then harms your child. Sure. And then when you try to speak up, you can be removed. From the church. From the church. You're not supposed to speak up. You're not supposed to even press charges. As soon as you find out, you let know you let the elders in the in your congregation know. Mm. And then those elders are mandated by the governing body member to just address it with their branch office and it just ends there you know you can't speak out you, when you do you're removed from the church mm. and the church takes no accountability no accountability but people are speaking out there's this lady um, her name is anonymous in hawaii recently i think last year actually mm. she you know spoke out and pressed charges and she won or was awarded 20 million dollars for her case Man. of being abused by a man for 12 years. I think it was 12 years or 20 years. No, the man was abusing children for 20 years and he had been abusing her since she was 12 years old. Sure. So after learning about all of this, I had to leave. And I learned mm. about this in 2016. I left officially in 2017. I didn't write her note because normally when you leave, you're supposed to disassociate and just say, I no longer identify as a Jehovah's Witness. And I didn't do that because I was born into this religion. Mm. I never signed up for this. So are there no threats when you are now leaving? Don't they threaten you? We know other churches where they tell you, if you leave, you die. You know? No, they did. And they came to visit me so many times at home to encourage me to come back, to come back. But at that time, it was still quite fresh and I was dealing with just so many things. Because when you leave the church, you unpack so much, especially if it's a church where you were with your family in mm. it. So I had to unpack my relationship with my parents. I had to unpack my relationship with the friends I had in the church. I had to unpack even my own life, my own viewpoint on so many things. So I was just dealing with so much. So when they came to see me and like they asked me, why are you not attending anymore? I just said, I've got problems. I'm dealing with just some personal problems, some mental health problems. And I said that twice. And then... I just told my mom, please tell these people to stop come seeing me. Because at the time I was still living at home and I said, just tell them to stop coming. Mm. I'll come back if I want to come back. Mm. But for now, please, they must leave me alone. Yeah. <laughs> so take me through Monica now telling her family that you are done with this. Oh, guys, that was so hard. That was so <laughs> I can hard. imagine. Honestly, what gave me the courage is that, is that I was working. I oh, had a job okay. and I was 24, you know, I mean, 24, you're old, you, yeah, like, no. you know, Make but I felt decision. like a child when I had to tell them this because I was just so fed up. And I even remember the date there was, it was the 10th of October, I think 2017. Mm. I was like, today I'm attending, they called the serv their services meeting. 
or meetings. I was like, today I'm attending my last meeting. I'm not going again because they attend twice a week now and on a weekday and on a weekend. Mm. And I was like, it was the weekend meeting. And I was like, ah, I'm done. I'm actually done. Like I'm wasting my time. Where I'm, why am I actually going here? Because I don't believe in any of these things. These people are actually dangerous because there's so many dangerous men walking around here. And I don't even know these people. Like I felt like I don't even know these people anymore. Mm. Even though I grew up in the church. So I went for the last day. It was a Friday with my mom and my dad. And Sunday came around. They knocked on my door. Wake up. And I'm like, I'm not going. My mom was like, what do you mean? I'm like, I'm not going. I'm <laughs> done. She's like, what? You know, my mom stopped talking to me. And we were living in the same house. She stopped talking For to me. For how long? A few weeks, you yeah. know. She was upset. She, was she took very it personal. Upset. She really did, you know. But because I'm a last born, I'm a very vocal person. And mm. I've always been very vocal in my family. So once I built the courage, I was like, this is a stupid religion. I don't have time for this. <laughs> I am over this. Yeah. I'm too grown for this. This religion, do you even know the history? Do you even know how it started? Have you done research on this? You just took us into a religion we didn't even research. And we're just blinded by the fact that, oh, there's white people here. And I even forgot to mention this. There was a, um, a pilot project they had in 2011 where they noticed there's a bit of separation between the white congregations and the black congregations. Yeah. So they tried to just merge them. Mm. So we were merged with an Afrikaans congregation uh. in Pretoria, What's it called? Not Pretoria North. Pretoria West. Mm. You know, and if you know Pretoria West, you know Pretoria West. Yeah. The white people that live there. So we were merged with a congregation from there. And you know, those people wouldn't shake our hands. They would come to our congregation and a few came. And then when we went, when it was our turn to go to the congregation, there's people who wouldn't shake our hands. So most of them are racist. They wouldn't even shake our hands. They sure. wouldn't even, you know, acknowledge us. And us black people were just excited. Oh my God. Mm, wanna belong yes you know we're just like, oh my god and we're just enjoying the fellowship yeah but because i went to a white school i was quick to pick it up and i was like oh something is off here mm. so maybe that was actually when it really started where i was like something is off here mm. but it was just at the back of my my head and eventually as the years went on i did realize that no my suspicions were right mm. yeah. so you spoke about sexual abuse do you know anybody who encountered it or you somehow went through some abuse in some sort? Mm. I'm very fortunate that I, I wasn't sexually abused, but I know so many women because I have a YouTube channel of my own mm. and I talk about this religion with my audience. A lot of them speak up about the abuse they experienced. And, you know, just quickly to go back to Japan. In Japan, when they were talk, when they were doing research, the minister... I forgot what the minister is called because it's a different name to ours. But they were saying that even just the process of having a victim explain their sexual encounter to a church member or a church leader in itself is also sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. Because oh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, it's very traumatic if you encounter sexual abuse or maybe you have sex before marriage mm -hmm. and then you want to confess to the elders and say, you know what, I sinned, I did this and this. They are very intrusive with the questions. They're not going to ask you, oh, you had a mishap and you slept with someone. They will ask you, how many times did you do it? Mm. Where did they ejaculate? What did you touch? How many, like, it's that <laughs> intrusive. So in itself, going through that process of mm. explaining your trauma, if you were sexually abused or if maybe you're explaining you know, the mistake that you made, it's another form of sexual abuse. So it's that deep and it's that heartbreaking. So literally when you sleep with someone, you must later go and confess. Yes, if you're not married, if you're not married to the person. But we have so many young people who are going through sexual abuse or even willingly they sleep with other people. So you are telling me each and every person would go and report to the elders. Some people would, you know, and I was that bad friend at church. I'm like, girl, <laughs> what are you God? telling anyone your business? Oh my God. Uh -huh. Do you know these people? <laughs> are you with them when they are at work? Because people be dating at work and doing the most. I was, like, I was always that friend. Do not tell anyone your business. Mm. Talk to God. The most mm. important thing in life is having your own personal relationship with God. Yeah. At the end of the day, everyone on this planet makes mistakes. The same way you see yourself as like, oh, you know what? Maybe I'm not good enough. That person is also not good enough. 
So you don't have to explain yourself to anyone. You don't have to tell them your business. So unfortunately, my friends would tell me after the fact, because also you don't talk about sex in that religion. They don't talk about, they don't talk about sex. Is it? Yeah. I, my, my friend who told me this, I actually met her, you know, later on in life. And she just told me like, oh, I did this a few years ago, you know. And once you tell them that, okay, no, I made this mistake, they tell you, they punish you. For example, in the church, um, mm. they have study, uh, like a study. For You know, the, the books that they publish. Okay. They also study them in the church. So, for example, they will read, they have, a, I forgot now, like a study on a Sunday. And then they'll read, you know, the publication. Mm. And then they'll read a paragraph. And then after reading the paragraph, people must, on, there's a question after that paragraph. So after reading the paragraph, they will ask the question and then people raise their hands and then you can answer. So if you've done a mistake, for example, they'll tell you, okay, for the next six months, you can't answer. At all. For the next six months, you can't go to field service. So you can't go and preach, mm. you know, until you change your ways or whatever. And so they would punish people for making mistakes like that. It's, it's mm. a church that really likes shaming people to oh, shame you. Condemnation. Yes basically to condition you they do it through shaming as well and even their publications they do that to condition you and program you so that you're brainwashed essentially mm. but what about all these ills that we are seeing in our country i mean there's abortions happening everywhere there's a problem of alcoholism so what if you are part of that religion and you are struggling with such things. You can confess to the elders, but what's sad <laughs> is sometimes you're confessing to someone who has the same problem same you problem. have, and they're just hiding it better than you, you know. Mm. But in the church, alcoholism, um, immorality, whatever you consider that to be, homophobia, um, all of those things are definitely condemned, and you can be removed for that. Okay. But if you, of course, confess to the elders and you allow them to help you, however they will help you, mm. then they might just, you know, rebuke you and say, okay, you know, you can't partake in certain activities for a certain time period, and after that, you're good to go. Yeah. So what's the process of removing someone? It, are they saying you are the worst sinner in the whole yes. world? You're not pure enough. Oh, guys. You know, there's people who've committed suicide from being removed. Ish. There's families that have been broken because of being removed. I can imagine. This religion conditions you to such a point where you can forsake your own family. Mm. You can forsake your own being, your own self as a person. So, for example, you did something immoral and you're feeling guilty about it. And you know what? I need to confess to the elders. You go to the elders. I need to talk to you guys. They'll set up a meeting after the church. Most congregations have something called a school B. And okay. most of the time, if someone goes to school B, you're in trouble. Mm. <laughs> so you'll go to school B and then you'll talk to the elders. And then, for example, if whatever whatever you did, you'll explain it to them. They'll have a, co a committee. And then after you've explained what happened to you, you will leave. They will stay behind and assess and determine whether you should be removed, whether they should just, you know... I can't think of the English word, or mm, whatever. Mm. Mm. No, kaula is when they actually remove you. Oh. So yeah, so then they'll decide. So mm. if they do then remove you, decide like, you know what, this is bad. Like for example, if you become pregnant out of wedlock and because like, okay, if you become pregnant out of wedlock, they will remove you. Um, if you get married to someone who's out of the church, they will remove you. The condition for you to not be removed is for you to break up with that person or to leave that person. But I mean, if you're pregnant, you can't leave that child. Oh, and I don't know. Yeah. So anyways, they will remove. So you. in simple terms, they're encouraging abortions. I mean, if you don't want to be removed, then you have to run and hide. Basically, mm. basically. But a, a, an abortion, you can also be removed for definitely, actually. So mm. once they've decided you will be removed, on a, it'll, depend, it'll depend on, a, I can't remember now which day they announce, but either a weekday or a Sunday when everyone is there. And sometimes they even encourage you, like even though they know they're going to remove you that day, they encourage you to be there so that you can even feel the shame even it's more. So what? But you'll sit at the back and they'll say, we're letting you guys know at the end of, like it's the end of the church service or the meeting, letting you guys, we're just letting you guys know that Monica Rasoroka has been removed. She's no longer seen or identified as one of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Sure. And it's always just like, <gasps> Because we, the people, you don't even know what's going on. You don't even know. like. So they don't inform you like, prior. prior? No, they let the person know who's being removed. Oh, okay. But we, the, the, the general the people, the congregation, we don't know. So it's always a shock. They're like, oh, what did this person do? But, you know, when you're removed, it's something massive. It's like, 
And it's so depressing because after that, I'm not allowed to speak to you anymore. If yeah. I see you on the street, I can't say hi. I can't, nothing. I, I, uh. I literally don't acknowledge you. However, you remember that day we came back from the YouTube event? Mm. A friend of mine texted me. She's like, girl, you need to check what the Jehovah's Witnesses are doing. It's crazy. So they changed this rule. Now when they remove you or when you're removed, people are allowed to say hi to you. <laughs> and they've changed the rules where women weren't even allowed to wear pants mm. to church. Now they can wear formal pants and men don't have to wear a tie or a jacket anymore. They can just wear a shirt. Now, what members don't know is why this rule change actually happened is because in no way the Jehovah's Witnesses have been deregistered as a religious organization, no? meaning that the government no longer gives them funding. So mm. in no way, if you're a church and you're registered with the government, the government gives you $1.5 million every year. Mm. The Jehovah's Witnesses are no longer able to access that grant because of child abuse allegations. So people like me who have left have spoken up in Norway and said, guys, you don't know what's going on in that church. Like things are crazy there. And mm. children, you know, the whole thing was, I was talking about, about being removed. They baptized to be, to be seen as a Jehovah's witness. You have to be baptized mm. and they baptized children as young as six years old. You're six years old. You don't even know what you're getting yourself into mm. and you're getting baptized. And as soon as you make a mistake, you get removed from the church. So even as a minor, you can be 15, 16 years old. If you do a mistake, your parents are not allowed to talk to you in the house. They just talk to you at like, Claude, come eat, We're blah, blah, blah. Like it's, it's, it's that surface level. They don't have deep conversations with you anymore. None of that. Mm. So people reported that and the government fortunately enough in Norway did their jobs and they investigated the Jehovah's Witnesses and withdrew the funding. And this is how you see that it's a cult. Well, scientifically it's been proven it's a cult. People can just research this, mm. but this is why, this is why, why you're also able to see that this is not necessarily a church. It's a business. They're just making money off of people because as soon as their money was taken away, they changed this rule that's been in existence for decades in the church where someone is removed and you don't talk to them. And yeah. women don't wear pants. So they've changed, they're changing all of these rules and men are allowed to grow beards now and all of these things so that governments around the world don't actually notice what's going on in this church because it's bad. Mm. It's very, very bad. And people invite them into their households. You invite these people because you're thinking, oh my gosh, they're going to talk to me about God. And us as Africans, we love God. We love spirituality. And mm. even if I know that I, I'm not going to join this church, I'll invite them to just listen. You don't know you're inviting a pedophile into your house. Yeah, anything can happen. Anything can happen. And they have a, vi a, 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 a an issue with violence in the church as well because of just of the conditioning and how men are seen as superior to women. You know, women in the church are seen as lesser than men. Mm. Like there's even a governing body member who said women have smaller brains than men. Yeah. So women are seen quite lesser than men in the church like women have no roles there's nothing you can become as a woman a man can become an elder a ministerial servant a circuit overseer an elder like there's so many positions you can do as a man a woman nothing you can just be a, a pioneer a pioneer is someone who preaches from house to house and they just do it like a full-time job like mm. they do it almost every day they have like a quota of hours i don't know if they still have because they've also changed the hours system but basically, women are, are treated like that in that church or cult, yeah. whatever. So, but then how did you suffer when you began to lose friends? Remember, after you went mm. out, you, nobody's supposed to be talking to you. How did that affect you mentally? I shunned them before they shunned me. Oh. So I just stopped attending and I deleted everyone's numbers. I unfriended people on social media. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I had a job. I just focused on my job. And then when I stopped working at that job, I was focusing on my schoolwork. So I was I just continued studying. So luckily, I just kept to myself. And I'm so fortunate that I have amazing siblings that always just reminded me, like, there's more to this world than this church. There's more to this world than those friends that you had. And those friends aren't truly, really, those people weren't truly really your friends. They were your friends because you were in the same religion. Mm. Because if someone is your friend or someone truly loves you, they love you unconditionally. Unconditionally means even if you don't subscribe to something I subscribe to, we're still we're friends. Still okay. We're still okay. Mm. So, yeah, I just left. It was difficult. You know, it was very, very difficult. Most recently, there's someone <laughs> who invited me to their wedding, literally two years ago. 
all her friends didn't even come. She's still a JW, of course. All her friends didn't even come. No one bought her gifts. I remember going to a wedding and like, there's no gifts. I'm like, oh my gosh, guys, someone's getting married. No gifts, no nothing. Mm. Didn't even have someone to give um, a best friend speech. Yo. I gave her the best friend speech. I bought a gift and everything. Not even a thank you. She never spoke to me after her wedding. <laughs> after all the efforts you put. Never mm. spoke to me again. And I think that was the last time I was like, you know what? I'm truly done <laughs> with <You're> this religion. <laughs> and it's you know, you tried to give it the benefit of the doubt. Because I was like, you're still my friend. Even though I've left, I will not judge you. I, mm. I, I still accept you. And how you've accepted me. Because she knew I was dating someone who's not part of the religion. We're still friends. Mm. I was encouraging her throughout her relationship with her partner. Even when she was doing immoral things. Mm. I was still there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, being a good friend. And after that, she just like... You know, so I learned my lesson then that, you know what, I need to just completely cut ties with these people and I can't really have a friendship with anyone or a mm. relationship. So it's very difficult at first when you leave, but you get used to it, you know, life moves on, you encounter new people, like I just met you and other mm. people and you move on with life. You don't let this hold you back. That's literally just a season or a phase in my life that I'm past and I don't allow it anymore to hold me back. Amen. I like that. So would you say with your chest that Jehovah's Witnesses is a cult? The Jehovah's Witnesses. Where's the camera? <laughs> the Jehovah's Witnesses? <laughs> the Jehovah's Witnesses are a cult. My Do God. your research, guys. Do your research. First of all, it was discovered by a Zionist, Charles Taser Russell, who was actually a millionaire from all of the donations that people gave from the church. Mm. And scientifically, there are criteria for a cult. There are eight the Jehovah's Witnesses fit into seven out of those eight. The only one mm. they don't fit into is the one where they make people use um, drugs or any medication to alter their, their minds. That's the only thing that they, do, they don't do. Everything else that makes a religion a cult, the Jehovah's Witnesses fit into. And just one more thing to add, cults also affect how you cognitively think as a person. That's right. So a lot of people, when you tell them like, oh, you're in a cult, immediately like there's blockers in their mind. They mm. don't even want to listen. That right there is something called cognitive dissonance. Mm. And basically a cult conditions you and programs you to, to think like that. Even in their publications, they tell people, don't listen to outside sources. Don't listen to people who talk negatively mm. about the Jehovah's Witnesses. All of those things. They don't tell associate. people, don't associate. Don't do, for me, it's don't even listen to me. Just do your research. Just Google the Jehovah's Witnesses. Just check Jehovah's Witnesses, child sexual abuse. Like, just Google and you will see for yourself. Yeah. But being in a cult is not something easy. So how can we help these people? Because it takes a lot for a person mm. to fully be delivered from such a thing. I mean, you were fortunate enough to say, you know what, I, this is not for me. But it might not be the case for everyone there at home. How do we help? How do we assist? Wow, well, guys, I, I don't even know. I, just, I didn't even prepare for this question because I, I normally don't even get that far. Mm. They need a lot of help. When you're in, a jo in the Jehovah's Witness organization, they mm. really make sure your whole life becomes part of this religion. So your friends, your family, you try to recruit everyone into that religion and anyone who's not re been recruited into the religion, you start limiting your time. And then when you want to leave or you realize mm, something is off here, it's very, very difficult to leave. It's so hard. I would just say is encourage those people, you know, encourage them and let them know that they are loved, they're accepted outside unconditionally. And I know a lot of people need assistance financially because mm. the Jehovah's Witnesses is a religion that also very much discourages people from pursuing careers or, you know, their passions. So a lot of people are just doing jobs to just get by, like uh, minimum wage jobs. So there's people who are very talented, people who are very smart, who never pursued those talents because of the religion. And they need your support when they leave. They need mm. someone to encourage them, whatever the situation may be. And there's a lot of women also dealing with domestic abuse in the religion because of the men. So... Mm. I don't even know where to start, but they need a lot of help. I know when I left, I just needed someone to listen. I needed someone to tell me that you, you're not being crazy. You know, mm. you're not losing your mind. You were in this religion. Like, this is what happened. And it's okay because you're so fearful. Like, even if I encounter Jehovah's Witness who knows me, 
give a take it to us sometimes. It's like, oh, I'm ready to or what now, you know? So it's very difficult yeah. when you leave and it's just hard. So I would say just encourage people and be patient with them, you know? Mm. It, it's a cult. It really affects even mentally how you think. So be patient with people and... I say make jokes about the religion as well. Like when you make jokes about the religion, <laughs> you make people just be like, oh, this is so stupid. This is mm. actually so dumb. And it sometimes makes you feel a little bit better. Like, you know what? It is what it is. And sure. hopefully you can move on. And I'm very lucky that I woke up at 24. There's people who wake up at 50. You know? 60. How do you go back? Life and has fix. moved on. Mm. Mm. Some people have, you know, they wake up and they've shunned their children. You don't even talk to your children anymore. And now you wake up, you realize, oh my gosh, this was a cult, a business. And I don't speak to my child anymore. Mm. So uh, people need a lot of support, especially as well for therapy, like mental health support. We need a lot, a lot. There's a lot of trauma you encounter in the religion. Mm. A lot. So you mentioned that your siblings managed to get out. You also. Tell us about your parents. Where are they now? What is happening? My mom does not know I'm doing this. She's still part of the church, oh. you know. And I'm very fortunate that she still has a relationship with me. My mom never shunned me. My mom never, you know. Yeah, I'm very lucky. I say this, that my parents loved me more than they loved the religion. Thank they God. loved the children more than they loved the religion. And I, I'm so lucky for that. My mom, I still have a relationship with her. With, with her. We're fine now. She's talking to me. But okay. with this podcast, one day cut her. <laughs> <laughs> My mom doesn't know YouTube. She's very young if she sees this. How did she get here? My mom does not know how YouTube works. Yeah. But even if she sees... I, I'm being very open with her and transparent that this is what I do now. I've quit my job. Like, this is what I do now. Mm. I am an activist. I speak out. And... Unfortunately, my father passed away last oh, year. That sorry. was very difficult. But I remember even on his deathbed, I was showing him my YouTube channel with like just a few subscribers. I'm like, this is what I'm doing right now. I mm. quit my job to do this. And he was just so confused. He's like, why would you quit your job? You have such a great job. Like, you know, and he passed away. But I definitely feel his hand guiding me. Like, the YouTube opportunity is definitely my father, I would say. Mm. And just the way things are working out, I can definitely see that it's his hand here guiding me. And my parents are very supportive. My siblings, very supportive, yeah, I must yeah. say. Like, I'm okay with them. So I'm, I'm very lucky in this instance that my family is supportive and understanding. My mom, not understanding. But she knows. Mm. Yeah. So take us through the journey of losing your father. How do they do these funeral things there? <sighs> yeah. <laughs> I am getting... <laughs> I'm getting traumatized today. <laughs> Guys, losing my father mm. was the most painful thing in the world. Yeah. You know, I started off this interview saying I had a present father. Mm. And it's something I never said. And when he passed, I realized just what a blessing it was to have a present black father. And... I'm not saying he was a perfect man, but mm. he was there. This man, when I would do my nails, he would go with me to the nail salon, my dad, and he'd wait for me outside. And people would come into the salon. Mm. And I'd be like, no, it's my dad. And people would be like, what? Your dad is here? You know? And I could just always rely on my dad. He was just such a, a great father to me, I must say, you know? Mm. And losing him was so difficult. I honestly feel like when everything happened, I like left my body. Like it yeah. was just such a shock. I didn't know how to process everything because I was just started a new job, my dream job. And, you know, we pray for things. And sometimes God is like, this is not for you. But you're like, I want this. I want mm. this. You work hard. And God is like, you know what? Have it. See for yourself. Yeah. I got the dream job. Horrible experience. Mm. horrible horrible growing up in a cult the programming and everything they also condition your consciousness mm. like one thing about jehovah's witnesses your consciousness really really works like doing things that are, are that are unethical is very difficult for us because we've yeah. been so conditioned to always lead a life of just being on the right path so i'm in this job i'm working for a prominent political figure they're doing shady things in the office mm. management is horrible I am having a hard time. This is literally my first month. I'm like, what is this job? Second month is horrible. Third month is horrible. My father becomes sick. He becomes paralyzed overnight. 
Like you literally, know? my dad walks today. Tomorrow, he can't walk. What? He goes to the hospital. And what the hell is going on here? At work, they don't even they don't they don't even care. My dad is sick. You know, I tell my manager, my father's sick. He's forgotten like my father is sick, you know. It was just so bad. Mm. End of January last year, I was like, you know what? I have to give. I have to give in to whatever hap- whatever's happening right now. I resigned from that job and I just immersed myself into the process of losing my father. And it was so difficult to see a parent slowly die because we found out he's got cancer. Mm. And to see him just wither away was so painful. I don't want to cry, but it was just so mm. painful. And I know what's also coming, that depressing JW or Jehovah's Witness funeral where mm. no one is talking about his life. No one is talking about what an amazing person he is. He it's mm. just about his faith. He believed in this and that, you know. And now as now as Jehovah's Witnesses, we understand that his belief system is this and this. Like, it's the coldest funeral ever. Ish. So cold. I didn't even cry that day. I didn't even cry. I was just like in shock. Mm. And literally I have a friend who also lost her father and she was telling me that girl, the funeral only starts after the funeral. Ish. But I feel like I lost my mind. It was so hard you, ugh, going through everything, but you know, it's painful, but I was able to unpack just so much and deal with it. And I feel like mm. I love my father even more now. Now that he's gone, like I love him even more, and it was so difficult. Oh, guys, Jehovah's Witnesses' funerals are horrible. Mm. <laughs> it's so cold, and it was even raining that day. <laughs> 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 mm. it's, it's just, and now I'm seeing people who don't even talk to me anymore. You know, some people <sighs> have already shunned me. I didn't know how to act and how to carry myself that day, but. You know, we move on and we live life and we carry on. And I just had to remind myself that this is the religion my parents chose. Mm. This is their path. I can't decide for them. So I had to let go of the need to control the situation and, you know, make it whatever. Like, I just had to let go and honor his belief system and honor what he wanted. And he wanted a Jehovah's Witness funeral and that's what he got. Mm. Condolences, man. I see that this is affecting you. Do you think your life, your family life, could have turned out different had you not crossed paths with being a Jehovah Witness? Oh, 100%. 100%. I am from such a talented family. I, I don't think I can even quantify this. I'm from a family where we are all gifted. Athletics, we're all good. Mm. Mentally, we're all smart. Mm. My family, we're all gifted. And this church robbed us of that because you're not supposed to, um, you know, follow your passions. You're not supposed to, you know, pursue your dreams. Your dream is the church. Mm. Everything is to the church. So my siblings, even I, have forsaken so many things. Like, I wanted to study international relations. But, um, but I couldn't because it means I'd have to, you know, represent South Africa. And as a Jehovah's Witness, you can't. You can't sing the national anthem. You can't honor the flag but so, you yes, can't you can't and then exactly so a lot of things i had to let go of so definitely i know that our lives would have been vastly different if my mom did not encounter this religion because she's the one who was the first jehovah's witness mm. but i don't you know dwell too much on that i remind myself every day that all of us as people we must be accountable for our own lives. We are all responsible for our own lives. So That's right. my responsibility now is to move on and it is to pursue my dreams and it is to do the things that I actually want to do and the things I was destined to do on this planet, in mm. this world. So that is my goal in life right now. I am serving Monica right now. Yes, I'm doing girl. my thing. I love that. And I'm no longer letting this experience define me. And you spoke about how this um, cult, I can boldly say it because you... <laughs> it's a cult. Don't come for me. I don't have <laughs> it's parents. It's a cult. <laughs> um, you mentioned that it affects you mentally more than anything. In, in brief, how did it affect you being in relationships after? <laughs> Guys, <laughs> when you're a Jehovah's Witness, you're in a mental prison. Mm. You know, literally. I hated that religion for this specifically because... 
I don't know what a good man is. But um, I don't know what a good relationship is because you never got to see good relationships. A good relationship in the church was just people who were very spiritual, people who were very active in the church. That's a good relationship. Mm. But later on, you found out, you'll find out that he's actually abusive or whatever the case Eish. may be, you know? So I, I don't, I never had a good example of what a healthy relationship is. And even the men I've chosen, it, it, in reflection now, I can mm. just see that I was just a very insecure, insecure girl. I didn't know my worth. And I, I was just trying to crawl out of a dark situation. You know? So now I know better. Yeah. I so. know better. <laughs> and I, I, I'm, I'm teaching myself to what is a good relationship, what is a good partner, what is a good man, you know, what is truly a good man. Mm. So I'm teaching myself that because... In the Jehovah's Witness world, you definitely don't get that. You don't. At all. Phew. Yeah, no, I'm traumatized. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I think I well. learned a lot because growing up, we would like check with the window on the curtain. Mm. There are people at the gate and they will say, don't answer, don't do anything. Now I understand. Mm. I mean, our lives could have been in danger. For real. For real. There's people in the church who literally fight. I remember... There was a in, in incident in our congregation where people came to the congregation with a crowbar and <laughs> attacked someone in the church because they're fighting for positions, they're fighting for money. Church positions. Yeah, church positions, money, whatever. Like those people are unhinged. <laughs> <They're> unhinged. <laughs> you know, I don't know how many fights I've seen at church, but it, it it's you see those things. It's a dangerous religion, honestly. No. But I must preface this, and I didn't say this in the beginning. There are good people. Mm. There are genuinely good people in the Jehovah's Witness religion. I must say that there's people who are just looking for salvation. There are people who just you know? want to please God. They just want to do the right thing. Mm. They just went to the wrong religion. I love that. And thank you so much for sharing your journey. It takes a lot for a person to open up. So let's talk about you being a creator as we are closing off our conversation. Where can people find you? What more do you do? Talk about how you, you know, the makeup part, you know, girl. <laughs> okay, guys, you can find me on my YouTube channel. I'm mm -hmm. at Monica Raseroka. I'm also at Monica Raseroka on Instagram and on TikTok. On TikTok, I create more of beauty content and I talk about African mm. knowledge. I did this course when I was doing my honors in communication sciences and the course is about decolonization or decolonizing mm. from colonization so i talk okay. a lot about my what i've learned and i impart some of that knowledge that i have in terms of african knowledge and then on instagram it's just more aesthetics and it's just beauty content mm. and youtube i go deep yeah youtube i unpack my jw experience i unpack a lot of african knowledge and i just i just share so people can find me there Mm. So do you help people who want to come out of this cult? Help in the sense of maybe I might talk to Connecting. you, definitely we can connect. But honestly, I'm also on this journey. I don't have the tools to, you know, help people come out. Mm. But I'm definitely in community. So if you're someone who wants to leave, you can definitely get in touch with me and we can definitely talk. I am definitely there to listen and encourage people. That's why I created the platform. So I will help people in that Instance, yeah, mm. and also I can connect you with other XJWs if you are interested as well. So yes, definitely people can reach out to me if they're thinking of leaving the religion. I will tell you, leave <laughs> as soon as possible. <laughs> I love that. I love your boldness. <laughs> and if you have watched us at home until this far, thank you so much. And do not forget to fully subscribe on this channel. And in case you would love to come and share your story with us, make sure that you follow me on Instagram. Queen underscore Rami M. And from my lovely guest and myself, it is goodbye for now. Bye.